Um, so how I got started is that I started homeschooling and I did what everybody else did, which was sex and math. All the smart people that I knew, because I wasn't very smart, uh, were all doing Saxon. And we did the 30 problems a day, every day for years. And it was okay in the beginning. And then as time kind of went on, my son started refusing to do a school, his math work. And, you know, I looked around, asked my friends, and all my friends' children were having the same problem. So they did the same. So I got really great ideas from them for like, make them run, make them do push-ups, do it at the very beginning of the day so that, you know, you can wreck their day. Okay, it's not really what they meant, but you can get it over with. So you could do math, these 30 problems at the beginning of the day so you can wreck their day, or you could save it to the end of the day is like the last thing you do so they can anticipate the math all day long and then wreck the end of their day. Um, and then eventually what happened is that we just fought a lot and it nearly destroyed our relationship. I can talk about it now, but when I first found Catenio, I couldn't talk about this without crying. Because it, anyway, this is my penance for being a really, really bad mom and teacher. I was a horrible math teacher, but he did score really well on his ACT test, um, really well. He got a 31, which is excellent on the ACT test, and he did excellent on math. But if you asked him to calculate how much carpet we needed in our living room, he couldn't tell you. It. He had no idea had no clue. So he couldn't use it. So when I got pregnant with my uh, youngest, I decided we had to solve our math problem. And I looked at all kinds of math curriculum and mostly the teacher's manuals, because that's where you learn. It's not the content that's different. It's how we teach that's different. And um, it was mostly all the same. And so I figured that I just would gave up and we were just going to play games until he was like in junior high. I didn't know what else to do, but I wasn't going to subject my child to what I had done the first time. And then one night at the middle of the night, I found base 10 blocks and Caleb Gatenio and my, the top of my head practically blew off and the angels started singing and glory shone all about anyway, just kidding. But it was everything that I was looking for and all the things that I knew that I had been missing. So, and Gatanio does this thing called algebra before arithmetic and the base 10 blocks are great. They're great. They're super great. And if you guys, I don't want anybody to feel guilty about saying, okay, I want to do numbers before we do arithmetic. I just want to give you the options so you know what the difference is and how it looks. Um, even if you just use the rods to model problems, you're going to get a much better education. Your kids will get a better education than they would have without them because rods are amazing. But Catenio does this thing called algebra before arithmetic and it changes everything everything, everything, your whole entire homeschool. So what is this thing, algebra before arithmetic? So what is algebra? What do we mean at the very beginning stages of education? Like, what are we even talking about? So let me get my pointer going and we will, let's see if I can do this. All right. So what we mean by algebra is there's two definitions that Gatenio gives. One is the study of the operational symbols and the rules for manipulating them. So Gatenio has this quote that he, and he said it often that if you, if uh, he says, let the teacher mind the symbols or if the parent minds the symbols, the everything else will take care of itself. And we're gonna come back to this definition because um, well, it's sort of vague and a bit squishy for our unmathematical ears. And he used another definition that I like and it makes it a lot easier to grasp. So he said that uh, that algebra is the study of the structure of the basic operations and fractions as operators. So what does this mean? Anyone have any ideas what we mean by the structure of the basic operations? By the way, this is a participatory class, so I expect you guys to respond. All right, and I don't read chats. Andrea, if you would keep an eye on the chat for me, that would be great. And if there's anything I need to know, could you just let me know? 
I, I will. Yes, I, I just copied the messages for people who weren't here at the beginning when you mentioned what the how it's going to run. So yeah, okay. Okay. Right, so Can you, you ask a question again, please? Yeah. So, so what does it mean? What do you think we mean by the study of the structure of the basic operations and fractions as operators? What are we even talking about? I'm thinking of uh, addition, multiplication, addition, subtraction, of multiplication, and division when it's yeah. Uh, so, so what do we mean by the structure of those operations? Right. So that's a great word. Put yeah, in I really, I really like looking the at the word, relationships um, between them. The, the what? Go ahead, say it again. Oh, looking at the relationships between them? Yeah, that's part of it, yes. Um, can you hear me? Uh-huh. So um, when I was first shown the Gatenio method and the Cuisinaire rods, it was the first time I had seen, my friend showed me two red rods together, two squared and that was the first time that I actually realized that two squared equals four, but it's a square. It's the shape of a square. And then also <laughs> cubed. I don't know why I never clicked for me in my like training, you know, math in school and everything. But it was the first time I realized it's a square. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I was, I don't know. Hmm, let me think. Uh, probably 41 when I figured that out. <laughs> Oh, it was such an aha moment. It just blew my mind. And I walked around telling everyone for like two weeks this summer about it. Yeah, like, do you know why we call it a square? Because it makes a square. It makes a square, yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So basically our world comes to us in the form of structures. And if it didn't, there is no way that we could make it any sense out of anything. We would be paralyzed, okay? We see a chair and we say, oh, that's a chair. It's meant for sitting on. And, you know, if you want to be brave, you can use it as a step stool if you need to. Uh, we don't have to see all possible chairs and then hold all possible chairs in our memories in order for us to identify a chair. Instead, we see a few representations of chairs and our brains make uh, finds relationships and makes connections between old information, the chairs that we've seen, and new information, chairs that we're going to come across in the future, and we can identify them as chairs. We don't have to waste all, uh, can you imagine what our lives would be like if we had to memorize all possible chairs to identify a single chair. That would be overwhelming. And I would have been done long, long, long ago because my memory, okay, I have met, half the time, I can't remember the names. I can't remember the name chair in general. So like I'm toast. So it's the structure that provides meaning and it gives us ability to make sense of our surroundings and to transform and manipulate them. So I sent this uh, image out this summer uh, to the Facebook group or to my uh, email group. <clears throat> and it's a matrix for studying the words formed from the base word struct. So there are a ton of curriculums out there, most of them for teaching spelling, and most of them are sound-based. When my son was, my oldest was young, we used the word, the, the book ABCs and all of its tricks, right? And so basically what they do is they te teach you all of, so all, we learn the sounds and we learn all the possible spellings for that sound. And then we learn all possible, like all the exceptions that go with it. All right, but this is structured word inquiry. And as it the name implies, we study the structure of spelling. So I just wanna look at this matrix and then let's just talk about what it is that we notice. Let me get my trusty thing over here so I can write down anything that you notice. Well, there are a lot of prefixes and a lot of suffixes. Okay, how do we know they're prefixes? So that's interesting. Lots of prefixes and lots of 
Yeah, the way the chart is made, it, it separates the prefixes before the root and the, the suffixes after on the shape of the chart. Okay, so even <laughs> though... Hold on. Maybe. Hey, that's enough. All right. So you know that, so you know that a prefix comes before and a suffix comes after, but hold on just a sec. Down to now. All right. So we have some idea that some, so there's a group of words right now. I'm going to call it group of words that come before and group of words that come after and after what after the root that's a so, struct right so we also know so i noticed that there's this word that has nothing else by it sitting in the center so we're going to call it a root or a base you can call it so structured word inquiry we call them different things i use them interchangeably but yes yeah, so we have a base word and that's in the and it's location. These are important to notice, locations of things. So that's in the center. So the base word is in the center. And then we have words that come before and words that come after. What else do we notice? Um, there are multiple prefixes or multiple suffixes for um, the base word. And like, there's a difference between prefixes and suffixes. It can have one or more. Oh, so some, so there are, so what you're saying is over here, so let me just yeah. ask if I get this. Over here we have some that only have one and some that have more than one. So there's like two in a row. Yeah. So, right, all right, so some, some prefixes have only one and some have more than one and same for there are uh, clearly different categories within the prefixes and the suffixes So the, the, so the category pre, so let me just get this, I'm going to just put it in different words and then to help me, you tell me if I'm understanding you correctly. So are you saying that in the bigger category of prefix, there's subcategories? Yes. Okay. So in, in the same four suffixes. So yes. in the side the category prefix, there are so there is an inside the category there are sub now what makes you think that's true and it's not category yep. it would be category sorry about that all right go what ahead makes you think that's true mm-hmm um, because they are grouped differently. All right. So they're not all in one big list. There isn't just a whole column of suffixes and a column of prefixes. There are five different boxes of prefixes and seven of um, suffixes. Okay. So these lines, right? So, so there's some things I want to know. So these lines have meaning. How it's arranged actually conveys meaning. So this being in the center has meaning. The where these are located here has meaning. The fact that these are separated has meaning. These come after, that also has a meaning. And, and the fact that these are divided also has meaning. And we don't study this all at once where you just pour it on. What happens when we study the structure of spelling then we, we use this is that we come across a word and we would study that what whatever prefixes and suffixes happen to be on that word. And then we learn how to attach those 
to a word. And it is because of structured word inquiry like that I learned that there are no exceptions in the English language for spelling. There aren't any. That's a lie that you have been told. There is an algebraic structure to the language and that structure in English, so in other languages, the structure is the structure is consistent, but in the English language, the how we put words together actually conveys meaning. And then what we can take from this and mix and match and combine words. And so we probably are not going to put, it, it's not okay to put in ob or in sub, those aren't going together, right? But we can put substruct, we don't do in substruct, they're not in the same category. So these have meaning and we can combine structuralism, right? That one works because we can go each of these and we can go across and we can go over here. So there's ways in which we can combine these words that we don't have to study every single individual word that is formed by a base of struct. We can actually learn how spelling works. And this is so much easier. It solves so much, it, it takes so much less time and you're able to make sense of the words that you read instead of having to look up every, because you don't, you don't pay attention to the supa, sub and the super and the infra every time you see them. Every time I would see these things in, an, in a new word, for me, it was like a new thing even though I'd seen it a hundred times because I hadn't separated the parts and figured out the relationships. I had to, every time we came across a new one, it's like looking at a new picture of a chair. And I have to commit that chair to my memory in order to remember that this is a chair. That is the most inefficient way to study anything. All right, so spelling has a structure. All right, um, before I go on, uh, does anybody have a comment on like when you see this structure sitting here, this we would call it a matrix, how does it change the way that you think about spelling or does it? Is it just me? I mean, I just, I guess it shows me how organized spelling is. I never looked at it this way before. Okay. It makes Any me think about the um, the meanings of the individual parts of the word rather than just the word as a whole. Right. And here's the deal. So if you study it like you're going to study algebra, when we add U-R-E, so I'm going to just go ahead and let's do this because I forgot. Let's go ahead and hold on. Let's look at U-R-E. So struct means to build. And this U-R-E here, this suffix means employment or result. Isn't that interesting? So structure is the result of building something. So we have this, all of these, every single one of these prefixes and every one of these suffixes have a meaning or have a way of changing the word and it's consistent. So an or is something or someone that takes an action on something else. So instructor, well, let's go here, instructor. So that said that OR, conductor, right? It's someone who conducts, instruct. This OR has a meaning. This ing has a meaning. So yes, all of these individual parts. So you don't have to memorize all of, the, you have to memorize all the individual words. You can look at all the individual components and learn how they function in a word. And then you can figure out, you can figure out the general meaning of words and you don't have to memorize all of them. I just find this amazing, right? All right, so let's look at another one. I. Let's I'm gonna put this away. Oh, I'm going to go back. Hold on. I'm going to go back. All right. So it's this structure of handwriting. This comes from Spalding, right? So we've done handwriting different ways. And handwriting is our nemesis. I have a son who, oh, 
I can't, hold on. We go back, let's go back. Oh, are we going forward? I wanna go backwards. Okay, here we go. So we can teach every individual letter or we can look at the basic structure of handwriting. These are the different strokes that you need to use to form letters. You can form all the letters from these basic strokes. We can teach them individually, or we can teach the structure and then apply that structure to individual letters. I don't know, how many of you guys have yet used the, what is it, the writing road to reading? No one? She, they, she very much has this whole, she doesn't come out and say it, but the, she has a very good understanding of the algebra of things when you read her material. It's actually very good. She makes it hard though. She makes it hard to implement, but she has a really good understanding of it. All right. Did anybody use a curriculum for handwriting or has anybody used a curriculum for handwriting that they used in that each individual letter was taught separately? I mean, I don't really use a curriculum for handwriting. Maybe I should. I just <laughs> sit down and we practice writing our name. <laughs> we stay in the lines. We stay, we stay in the lines. <laughs> well, <laughs> that didn't work for us very well. So we'll, well use them. For kids, so it might not work out so well with my second, but we'll see. <laughs> well, so I'm learning from you guys about different handwriting curriculums. Yeah, so we, we've done both. Um with my son trying to make it easy we've used these indent things i have one that's but the, but doing the basic strokes we practiced and practiced and practiced these until we could actually form them and then we could just combine them to make the but to do any every individual most i think most curriculum use strokes some variation of strokes so we have already we have already things that we're familiar with as far as teaching the algebra before we do the individual parts. Um, all right. So what else has structure? Hopefully, uh, hopefully our lives. <laughs> so you're hopefully our lives. <laughs> well, so that is a cognitive thing when, when you don't write like, so that is a being unable to see, like if you take the notice, wonder, discover bootcamp, Children who have autism and um, who are on the spectrum, and my son is on the spectrum, so you can see how this this is very disconcerting for him. But if you don't, if you can't recognize the overarching structure of things, every day that you wake up, it's like you're in a brand new place with no ability. You can't make connections between the relationships between things. And imagine that like that's how you woke up every day. And that you, you're you unable to connect old information to new information. So every day you get up, it's like being in a place that you've never been before. And then, then you have to then sit down and learn on top of that without ha having a brain that actually is able to make those connections. That is horrible. So yes, it is a terrible thing if your life does not have structure. Terrible. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, calendars have structure, weeks and days and months. Yes. Calendars, weeks, days, months. Um, music? Music, highly structured. Literature and fairy tales. How many stories are there? There's only so many stories, right? There's there's like, there's, a, there's just a few. Some people would say there's only one, which is the hero's journey, right? There's only one story. And then every, that's, I don't buy that, but there's only so many stories that can be told. And then everything else is a variation on those particular stories with, it might, you might change characters. You might change, uh, you might change the setting, you might change, but the, but the story arc, there's only so many of them. There's a, there's a limitation. 
And you can learn the structure of stories. Grammar, so the English language, not just spelling, but grammar is a structure. Um, there's a whole world and there's, and seeing the patterns, the structure, the structural patterns um, helps, well, well, solves lots of issues, uh, but it's, it's everywhere. So patterns aren't just mathematical things, they're everywhere. All right, so let's see. Um, so let's talk about the difference between, when we're doing this, the difference between algebraic thinking and arithmetic thinking. Um, all right. Is this equation true? And how do we know? You have the same thing on both sides. Okay, tell me more about, okay, I'm going to write it down here. You have the same thing on both sides. How did you determine that they were the same things? Um, it's not a trick question. I, I don't know that I had a process. I, I mean, I just saw that there's a two on each side and a three on each side. And they both have the same operational symbols. Okay, so that's actually what I wanted. <laughs> All right, so uh, you noticed that they have the same uh, same numbers and O B E yeah operational symbols on both sides. All right, did anyone else? And yeah. along with that, we have to know that it doesn't matter what order we add them in. Ah. That we're not going to get a different answer if we switch them around. Okay. So Denise says she knows. Denise knows that we, that it doesn't matter the order numbers are. And the sum will be the same. All right, anyone else? Did anyone add both sides? And decide it's five on both sides. I think my mind might just automatically do that. <laughs> but I, that that would be more the arithmetic thinking that, that 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 it adds up to five and therefore they're both five. But I think it just happens automatically in my mind. All right. So was Denise the only one that added five? Well, I think I saw. I mean. Like when I looked at it, I saw that it was five on each side. I Okay. I didn't have to think about it. Okay. All right. I'll I should have put I should have put bigger numbers up there. That's what I should have done. I should have followed a quote from, but I didn't want to make I didn't want to follow the quote. So I'll I'll get there. All right. So there's so here's the difference. Um and Denise is correct. One is um, in this situation, we, we, we add, we can add these up and we can see that one side is five and the other side is five, or we can look at them and we can say one side is two and three and the other side is three and two. And it doesn't matter. We don't have to add them. It wouldn't matter if these numbers were 487 and 326, right? Those are the two numbers I could have used, right? It doesn't matter which which order those two are in and how we add them. It's going to be the same. So what we want to do, um, okay, so what do we learn from this? I'm going to just, just stick to the script. 
All right. So, let me delete this. So algebraic thinking stresses operations and structure. So this is from Dave Hewitt. This is his definition of algebra and algebraic thinking. Algebraic thinking stresses operations and the structure as the objects of our attention. So this this is where, where we are putting our attention, whereas arithmetic thinking stresses the processes with the results being the object of our attention. So let's, um, here. What do we learn from this? All of this. That our minds don't, or our eyes don't know where to look. Okay, so on any individual one of these things. So I probably put too many pictures up here. But here's the thing that I noticed that this is all of these are focused on. We complete these. Uh, I have to learn how to do it here. Was it before? All right. Where is our attention? On the answer? On the answer. On the answer. Yeah. yeah. What did we learn about math? When we were kids, it's all about getting the right, all about getting the right answer. What is, if you go to, um, and there's all kinds of, I just read this whole thing on like three chapters of a book on, I can't remember the name of the book. I'll have to, I'll put it up if you guys want. I didn't give you references to where this, a lot of this stuff comes from. Uh, like Dave Hewitt's quotes and stuff, I will put them in an email so that you guys can look this stuff up if you want to. But on the equal sign and the equal sign confusion, when kids are in seventh, eighth, ninth grade and the struggle that they have. And so if I go into, and it doesn't matter if it's a homeschool class or if it's um, kids that I'm tutoring, um, if I say to them, what does this mean? So you're going to tell me what it means. If you've taken my classes before, you can't say what it means. Um, it means the same. It means the same. So most students, most kids think that this sign right here is an indication that the answer comes next. And we call that equal sign confusion. And we get that, they get that because that is our focus. Most of the time when we're focused on arithmetic and you can't help it. So I'm gonna, I wanna go off script, I won't. I'm gonna just erase this and keep going. And then at the end, we'll talk about it. All right, so how does, how do we do this thing? How do we go from, focusing on uh, processes to get to an answer where that's where our attention is to actually focusing on the structure of things and uh, studying the, the symbols instead. So Cuisinaire makes this stuff super, oh, I'm going to go this way. We did this already. So Cuisinaire rods are amazing because they make it possible for us to study the structures. So I have a train and on trains, we can study, trains allow us to study uh, addition, uh, subtraction, uh, multiples. If we put two trains together, we can study uh, fractions. They allow us to study, why did I say difference? Um, Let's see what else. Hold on. Let me go back over here. All right. Mats and rectangles make it possible to study fractions, multiplication, division, and combinatorics, the distributive property, factoring, percentages, and a whole lot more. I just um, found out that we could study calculus on uh, 
on rectangles. I didn't even know that. All right, crosses are shorthand for a single color rectangle and they allow us to study multiplication in depth. Towers uh, help us explore the relationships between the factors, fractions, and division. L's are just shorthand for single color towers and they are a brilliant way of studying exponents, uh, multiplying and dividing exponents and logarithms. And staircases is the last structure that I have on here. Uh, and they allow us to study every single operation, factors, fractions, logarithms, and a whole lot more. And these six basic structures, so when we say we're studying the structure of something, we actually do have these concrete structures that we can actually study to help us make sense of math. So um, what does this look like practically? So like, how is this different than say Saxon or Math Mammoth or Life of Fred or whatever? So the difference, as I said before, is like where we're going to focus our attention as teachers. So Gitanio said, mind the symbols. So let's talk about what mom's going to be doing when we're going to pull out some trains and we're going to explore trains. All right. So the, the important thing here is not if we give these a number that two, right? If white is one, that two and three and two make seven. That's okay. That is the least important piece of information that we need to that we need ha to have when we find a when we build a train. All right. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So before I ever touch a worksheet or look at the book, we're going to build lots and lots of trains. So we're going to measure things with the trains. We are going to use different kinds of trains. We're going to use trains of two colors, trains of three colors, trains of one color, trains of all kinds of colors. We're going to go look at the shortest possible train to measure something with and then the longest possible train to measure something with. And then um, we're going to notice what happens right? What's easier? What's harder? W what gives us a more accurate way of measuring? What's closest to the actual length of the thing that we're measuring? Uh, we're going to build trains. Um, uh, we're going to build trains from different directions. We're going to give directions. From, so we're going to give directions on how to build trains. And then we're going to take directions. So from somebody else. So I'm going to tell you how to build a train. And then we're going to have our student tell me how to build a train. And what's going to happen when we tell other people that we, we want to build trains, right? So we're going, we're going to have to have a language and a way in which to talk about trains, right? So if I tell you to build a train that's uh, light green, red, red, is that this train? No. no, this train is a red, green, red train, red, light, green, red train. And we have to have a way, we have to develop a language and come up with some sort of understanding about how we talk about things so that other people can understand us. Um, we're going to compare trains. We're going to rearrange the cars on the trains. All right, uh, somebody who's here, I'm going to have to. Here, there we go. All right, um, we're gonna rearrange them. We're gonna make it take a train and we're gonna make it bigger. We're gonna take trains and make it smaller. We'll make it smaller by a certain length of a rod, but maybe that rod isn't in our train. So we're going to have to switch out and we're gonna make substitutions. We're gonna do all this and we're gonna ask questions. What happens? What can I do? Can I substitute? Can I substitute the light green rod for the yellow rod? Can I do that? What happens if I do? Was well, my train the same length? Can I do this willy nilly, or does it, are there restraints on what I on on what I can do, what I can't do? What happens if I rearrange these cars? Are there does it still going to be the same length, or does it change? Does the length change? Um, that's what we mean by studying a structure. And then once we've done this and we've played and um, we're just going to ask the question, what happens? Then we're going to go into the course and we're going to find out that there's a language. There's some form of language that we have so that we can all understand what we're talking about. And that language we're going to find out for just building the length of a train, we're going to start with addition. And we're not starting with symbols. We just start with this word 
plus. And that means that the rods aren't end to end, right? And, we, and we're gonna read them from left to right. So that's how we do it so that people can understand what we're saying. These are all conventions that um, this is the stuff that has to be memorized. The stuff that we've been playing with, that doesn't have to be memorized. You're gonna just learn how it works. When it comes to language, that, that's when we have to start using our memory. So there's no way around it. Like there's nothing about this that says, nothing about this that says that we should read from here to here, right? There's like, why can't you read backwards or why can't we start in the middle? And some of your kids are gonna wanna do that. And then you're gonna know that they have directionality problems and we're gonna have to mediate that, but that's a different deal. So you're going to be focusing as a mom on, um, on what can we do? What can't we do? And then ways in which, um, you're going to connect it to the stuff that you already know, and then what ways in which you're going to add language that we can describe the things that we're seeing and the phenomena that we're coming across. And because rods behave uh, like numbers, we actually, from just playing with, with trains, can learn how addition works. Um, and once that we have the words of addition to describe what we're doing, we're going to go back to trains come back to trains with our new language of addition, and we're going to study trains again because we're going to learn more once we have more language. And then that's going to get cumbersome, right? So we're going to need symbols, right? So if I give you a train of 15 red to read, right, we can do that. I'm going to read, red, 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 a whole line of red rods. That's going to get really, really cumbersome. So we're going to need to give you some symbols to write with because that's faster. All right. But then if you have to write red plus red plus red 15 times, that's going to get really hard um, and your hands are going to get sore. And then you're going to need and require the language of multiplication so that we can just write 15 R. Right. That's how this happens as we study. And as you you're going to be given the language to describe the things that you're seeing and make sense of it. It doesn't matter. We don't have to know what 15 R is. We don't have to know any of that stuff. We just have to know that when we combine things together, right, we can do that and we can just write the number of rods and then the color of the rod. Now we can't do that. We're going to notice that we can't do that if it's uh we can't mix the red and green and write 15 R if it's red and green, but we can do, if we have 15 sets of red and green, we can do that. We can do that and make sense out of it. Um, anyway, every time we add more language, we're gonna come back and restudy the structures again. Um, and the more language that we have, the more, the more ways that you can describe the structure and the structures don't change. And the great thing about these six basic structures is that every time that we bring them out, this is a familiar place. We've been here before. There's rules that govern the space that they're in. We don't have to relearn them every time the structure comes out and we have more language. The rules have been the same since the very beginning. All we're doing is giving new language to the thing, the phenomenon that we're seeing, right? Like, so there's, we can well, I'm going to not. We'll do this in a workshop. I get so excited about this. I could go off on tangents. All right. And we'll never get done. You'll be here forever. All right. Does anybody have any questions about this part? This whole, what does mom do? What is mom doing? All right. So when he went back, I'm going to go back to the um, the word the, the word matrix, and there's things that we saw there, or that Denise pointed. She started the very there's these things that come in the beginning. They're prefixes. Well, she knows they're prefixes because she has the language for it. And then we have this root word, and then there's suffixes, and we're going to call them suffix because she has the language, so she can talk about prefixes and suffixes. All right, but the very basic thing of, there's there's this one word in the center, and there's this stuff that comes before, and this there's stuff that comes after. And we don't notice this stuff. We think it's not important, and this stuff actually has meaning. And our whole culture, one of the things that our modern lives have done is actually flatten everything, um, and we don't have, we don't notice stuff 
anymore. And if you don't notice, right, you can't make sense of what you're seeing. So while we're studying the structures in mathematics, we're developing the cognitive skills necessary to get along and function in our world so that we can make sense of it and manipulate it. So all the stuff that we did before, right, all the stuff, the stuff with um, the trains or any of the things that I talked about, right, none of that had anything to do with calculating. It's only about observing the properties of trains. Sonia, I need to interrupt you a bit. Val is asking if we have to go, where can we find the recording? So if you go to the very first lesson on in the introduction thing, they'll be, they'll say for mom, right? Like there's this whole thing in there and there's um, a collection of links. I know. And there's, that's where you will find it. Hopefully this will get in your dashboard, but I have to finish a few things before I can just put it in your dashboard. But in a few weeks. All right, any questions? All right, so one of the other things you're gonna be doing while you're exploring trains, and we're not gonna talk about this much today, unless at the very end we have time um, because we're gonna come back to it in the other workshops. Um, oh, look, I was supposed to hit that thing. All right, this is what you're gonna be doing. You can see it. So you need to direct your attention to the structure and figure out how the structure works and how to talk about it. All right, so one of the things you'd be doing is attending to your student. So what's going on with my student? What are they thinking? How are they thinking about this? What do they notice? And one of the things, we're gonna do this before we sit down with a sheet of paper and we're just gonna build and talk is you want your kids to start talking to you. And so that means that you're going to have to also start talking. And it doesn't matter if what you think you notice seems silly. Um, the before, the after, the lines, all of, you don't know if it means anything until you write it down and you see if you can find relationships somewhere. So everything, we write everything that we notice down. Um, and you want them to start talking to you. And in their talking, you're going to figure out um, what's going on in their heads. And so we want to start looking for, one of the things you're going to be looking for is all of us have cognitive issues. And that's, you tell, you know, like that, that's what we're doing is developing awareness. So that's the other thing. You can do this without the algebra, but the developing the cognitive skills is the other component of this. So that's the notice, wonder, discover part. And um, that's, I would say, is even more important than the algebra part, because we want to be paying attention to that, but we will get into this more as the rest of the do more workshops. All right, so. Um, all right. All right, so I'm gonna spend some time, a little time after this answering questions. So, but before I do, I wanna talk about a little bit about mixing numbers-based curriculums and Gitenio's work and why I do not recommend doing this in the beginning. So Gitenio, Dick Tafta, Dave Hewitt, many others, I will send this stuff to you if you guys want to look up where they talk about the problems and why we should teach algebra first. Um, and they will all tell you that as soon as you introduce numbers, students will forget the structure and focus on the end result, which is calculations. Students will always default to calculations. And this becomes a huge problem when they get to algebra in high school. And one of the one of the guys that I was just reading, and he was put out a study in 2000, and he said that he believes that this stems from spending too much time in the concrete aspect of arithmetic early on. So that that having that equal sign with a blank, with this blank space to enter a number really does shape the way that you think of, about how math works. So um, Dave Hewitt and John Mason go so far as to prohibit calculations, uh, but instead they allow students to write the calculations they would have done, they just don't let them complete them. 
Uh, Hewitt will may use the numbers that are too big to count so that students must focus on the underlying structure of the situation rather than calculating. And I'm going to just read this long quote from Dave Hewitt. And sorry, this is the only one that's like this. Won't It won't torture you with long quotes. So he said, the principle of never carrying out any arithmetic, but just writing down what arithmetic you you would do can allow the structured way of seeing to be expressed within a written ex expression. Such, such expressions and their associated ways of seeing are a step towards seeing generally through a particular example. To aid this process of not carrying out any arithmetic and stru stressing structure instead, it is worth teachers considering offering just one example, one example for learners to work on. This example should be one which is sufficiently complex so that learners are not able to count and are unlikely to be able to do any unnecessary arithmetic, any necessary arithmetic. This will increase the likelihood of learners expressing the structure they observe and writing it in a form which preserves that structure. Such a large, oh, since a large number will be involved, this acts as a quasi variable in which the number acts as if it were a variable as learners have a sense that this could be any other number and the expression would still be true. And this is obviously for students who get to be older. We're not dealing with this when kids are four, five, and six. But the principle, which is students will default to calculations. And I suspect, uh, Gitanio talked about students have a need to combine things to make sense of things. So that's why he kept numbers separate. And uh, Guitard has a whole thing in her book on mathematics and children on why we shouldn't put numbers, put the numbers need to come later because there will be a time in which we do do uh, that we want to explore arithmetic thinking, but it's not until we have an understanding of the structure, the underlying structure. Um, Anyway, as I say, so when we introduce numbers, we want students to apply um, the knowledge of how the symbols work and their understanding of addition to numbers. We don't want to start with numbers and then try and figure out the structure when we're in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And your kids, like this is really is algebra. We're not I'm not pretending when we, it's not some cute little thing that we're talking about. We are actually doing algebra first and then so skipping to ninth grade and then coming back and doing kindergarten, right? That's what we're doing. We're not, it's not a pretend thing. This actually is a real thing. And so um, I think that's all I have to say, right? So uh, anyway, my last one, here's my little last comment I have on my, because I'm reading from the script here, otherwise I'll get lost. Uh, so doing it this way gives students a space to develop the thinking skills required uh, to develop an understanding of the structure of, of math and ways of thinking about it before we narrow their focus to a tiny little portion of math that isn't even particularly interesting unless, of course, you intend to be an accountant. All right. Any questions? Now we're good. Any questions on this? Or comments or discussion? And I don't bite. Hi, Sonia Neha here. Hello. Um, I have a question, but um, if there is any other question before that, it's okay. I'll just go ahead. You, it, somebody needs to do it first. Okay. So, 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 that, so that you have to break the tension. Yeah. So my question is regarding this last slide, which we have on the screen, introducing numbers. So my son is going to be in first grade now, and we have been doing course one, and we have kind of finished like introduction to Kuziner Rods one, like uh -huh. the first course you have. Mm -hmm. And... Um, like I'm 100% sure we are not going to introduce numbers for another six months or so because I need to cover more. But when I go to the second course of introduction to Kuzinir Roths 2, it does a brief of all the operations which we have done in course one and then it goes to numbers. But I'm looking for more um, concepts to be introduced through the Roths yet because 
my son loves numbers so once i start numbers it was a hard for time for me to bring him from numbers to letters now if i introduce letter like numbers again he's not going to come back at all <laughs> so i want <laughs> to introduce all the concepts which i can through the letters first before i introduce numbers so how do i proceed now i am looking at the caleb gatenio's book and the chambers book sorry and the handful of activities that i'm going to read now but um, do you have any suggestion where to go in your courses and all which like my my son loves the fancy worksheets you have so yeah um so here's what i can suggest to you and this is so you're doing basically what we did and i didn't have the worksheets so i would we, we had introduced squares that was no big deal yeah you just build a square right <laughs> um right we i mean like this stuff isn't hard like once we've done some of this stuff like it's not going to be a big deal if you introduce squares and then okay. you can say uh what's this side and what's this side right mm -hmm. so and we have to make a distinction so we're gonna have to measure if you're going to use your because i'm going to escape out of here and go to uh Go get some rods. All right. So there's two ways of reading this. And um, we can read this as four purple, or we can read it as purple squared. If you want them to use it as a true variable, then we're going to read it as purple squared or like, right, this is purple squared. And I would not be doing four purple. I would, you know, depend, like if you're going to start heading down this road, then you have to measure purple by purple. And this, this one here gets a little tricky, uh, but it doesn't have to be tricky. It just depends on how you approach it. But this is just purple squared. And this side is purple times purple, not four purple. Um, and we, we call this four purple, right? for a reason cuz we're still we're going to we're going to work towards doing numbers and we've been counting and building and we're going to work towards factors and fractions but this length is 1 only if this is 1 right if this is 1 if white is 1 then this length right here is 1 so just keep that in mind that's all but i would just go to anything that you think he can do staircases are excellent to practice because you can do logarithms on staircases um we can go here and exponents and you can do exponents right we can do building towers you can go that way and you can multiply and divide so anything that you see with a number on it just replace it with the color um that he's doing and you can you can easily transfer it like in the handbook of activities anywhere where there's numbers just put letters there and you'll be good but you're gonna that's basically what we did and then we finished um book two and four like the rest of it took us like two years and then we just did um I just sent him to he so my son's in private school this year and um he did their math evaluation and he's we, we he's on the spectrum he's got issues the kid can't write his can't write like we can barely get socks on before we go out the door. Some days we forget underwear, you know, basic things like basic life skills we're working on. But and he's very average as far as school goes. He's a super average kid. And we just did we went through the math to do the evaluation and he finished IXL. And the only thing that they had left to do was um, the only questions he was getting were from algebra two or calculus. So this works, right? And you're going to just, you know, and I think a lot of the reason why he was able to do so well is that we spent that long time doing letters and working on the letters and working on the algebra. And just as much as I could think of to do, we just figured out a way to do it. It's not, I don't know if that's really very helpful, but that's what we did. No, I got it. Um, I'm going to look in those two books. Um the only question I have left is, um, do you have any references to those activities in your course um, or they come after numbers in your course? 
So I have, so basically the courses were to get you through book one and finished. Anything that you get to, so like you can do like at the end of the algebra course, there's a whole thing on polynomials in there. That does, that's not a Gitanio stuff. That's from other things. You can do that. I mean, totally do that. You can, he can probably factor polynomials all day long. Um, and you can add uh, varials, but uh, there's other things that you can get, like, um, but if you just send me it to send me a thing, and I will send you some a list of some of the resources that I have that I think that you might find helpful. Just looking for activities like dot matrix math is one. Um, there's um, what is it? There's the bow tie. There's a there's a book called Something Bowtie, and these are geometry things, and you can you can do those. Um, what else do I have? Um, anyway, jot me an email, and I'll send you some stuff. Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Because what I feel is he has done the chapter three in Gatania one, uh, uh -huh. and. Um, he, he has got all the concepts of chapter three, but we are still working on because there is no limit on doing it. And I still feel he would be good if we do more and more. But at the same time, if I just do the same thing, he gets bored. So I need to introduce new concepts. So it's still interesting for him. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 I'm, Ex I'm gonna exponents are email. fun. Exponents are yeah. fun. Just introduce those and the towers are fun. They're fun to play with. Sure. I'll just drop you an email. Thank you so okay. much. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I know we were in contact over uh, Messenger about the common difference. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, uh, the whole point of common difference is to see that, uh, is it trying to introduce substitution? Well, Meaning, like, you look okay. at orange, so so it's so, uh -huh. so here's why I wanted you to come. This is why I wanted you to thank you. So okay. So when we're gonna look at staircases, and I am you have encouraged me to change the way I do this, by the way. So uh -huh. and I so that's why I said there are no dumb, please don't assume that you have dumb questions because I realized um that what I should have done is had a whole section there on playing with staircases. Let's just play with them. Let's build them. Let's build multiple. It's the same thing I just said about trains. We're going to do the same thing with staircases. What happens when you combine staircases? How many ways can we combine staircases? How many different kinds of staircases can we build? And we should do all this playing with staircases before we get here so that you have, because you're getting hung up on this one right thing, right? Uh -huh. Like there's this right way that I'm supposed to be doing this and, or there's this right thing. I'm okay. Yeah. I want you to get common difference, but there's so much here to get. And I can't put it all down, right? There's no way for me to put down for you everything that you should see. So what I want the, the goal, my goal was for us to figure out how we can make common difference and how does this work? So if we have, this is our staircase all right, and each one of these have a common difference of one. Like, right? how are we going to get to common difference of two from here? Right. Okay. So, so, the, so, what they're going to do is your kids will go, okay, well, it has a common difference of one. So, what is your first inclination? <laughs> well, it will be to put a red rod on each step, right? Mm -hmm. so let's do that. Did it work? That's not going to work because we can add a red and we're going to get a com still get a common difference of one. Right? Okay. So how are we going to get a common difference of two? That's the question. So we figured out, right? You figured out that we have, would have to, we can put on top of this staircase another staircase. And we put another staircase on top. What happens? Then we get a common difference of red. Okay, right. Now we have a common difference of red or two. All right. Now what happens if we shift the staircase? Like what happens? Can we move it? Like if I move, if I move the staircase up, 
hold on. I'm sorry. If I move the staircase up, do I still get a common difference of two? If I shift it down, do I still get a common? Like, how does this work? That's the question you're looking at when you're mom and you're looking at them. The question you should be asking yourself is, how does this work? So what happens? So we, so you built this thing. So those of you guys who don't know, we've been having this ongoing for a week conversation through messenger. It's not a very fun way to have a conversation, by the way, but it needs, this conversation needs to be moved to the course, right? So that everybody can see it. So they don't have to do this twice, but then other people would have comments and they, they would have comments about things that they noticed. So the thing that you notice, okay, so we started and let's flip this one. We're going to rotate it. All right. So we're having this conversation about common. So common difference is the space between, for those who don't know, the space between each step. And we notice that each step has a common difference of one. If I remove that. And these are our counting numbers. We count plus one. All right. So the question is, how do we get a common difference of red? And, and we, we learned that we could add, <clears throat> we learned that we can add the same amount to each to each step, we can add or we can subtract the same amount and the common difference isn't going to change. So how are we gonna get a common difference? So we said, okay, well, we'll add another staircase. So we can put a staircase on top. Now the question is, all right, let's do this. Oh, you know what I can do? This, duh. All right. Put a staircase on top. And so the question isn't what's the right answer? The question is, uh, what can I learn from this? What's happening here? That's the question. Not what, not necessarily what's the right answer. If it takes you two weeks to figure it out, that's fine. Because you're going to learn all kinds of stuff about how staircases work while you're trying to figure this out. All right. So this is what we have next. All right. So then I said, okay, I want you to move this down. This is none of this is in the course. This is all just stuff I'm coming up with to help you think through what's what's what you're seeing. So I said, okay, because um, we had a little bit of trouble making making common difference. All right, so let's move this down. What happens when we move the staircase down one? Question is, are we still going to get a common difference of two? That's really interesting. Okay, there. All right, so we can shift. Now we know that we can shift this staircase. We can put another staircase on top and shift it. All right, and we still have a common difference of one. And isn't this interesting? If we put this, we've got this one. And what are we gonna put here to get a common difference? Or we have a common difference of, what are we gonna put here to get a common difference of red? So let's rotate this. How cool is this? And the piece that fell off there, goes up there. And if we shift it again, what's going to happen? If we shift this down one. Yeah, it'll still be a common difference of two. I mean, of red. Um, now. Right, and what happens to this red rod? Yeah, I guess that was my uh, kind of confusion. I'm like, you know, it seems like it seems like we're losing part of the bottom staircase, right? Or we're losing part of the staircases in this case, and that's okay. Well, yeah, you can do whatever. Yeah, it's okay. You do whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Well, all we're doing is looking to see what happens, and I hadn't thought about this until I told you to do it. That like, if you move it down. If you move this staircase down, like, of course, this is how it would happen. But I was excited to see this, that, that the pieces, when you move them down, just go back up here. That you as you move a it copy down, of the white one up there. It's right here. No, on the next row. Nope. No white. Nope. Oh, well, hold on. You need the it's orange, I the have white, it wrong. and the red. Uh, no, because oh. I had it. Yeah, it was. Okay. okay. Yeah, but do you see, like, I wasn't, I mean, of course, this What's is how it would happen. happen. Right? Of course, this is exactly how this would happen. That makes sense. But it didn't occur to me that this is what would happen. Right? Because we get up here, we have 10, we, we, or we have what here is an orange, and it's moved down one, and then we just have the staircase starting all over again. Well, these are these are the staircase, which is now your, your team numbers. So, of course, that's how this would happen. 
Oh, we can just put this down. A, hold on a second. Hey, let me. Okay, did I just say no? No, put it back right now. Thank you. No, no, no. I gave you permit. I gave you instructions, Roberta. Okay. I gave you guys instructions not to touch it. Not okay. Get out of Mom, All right. So, so there isn't a when you're looking at this and playing around with it. There's not a right or a wrong way to do an exploration. We're just looking to see what happens, and then noting that, like noting that. So then, here's the the next thing is how do we note what happened? Right. So something equals something over here is going to be two. Or red, we can put red. Let's go back with what I said, but we can do, here we go. Red, the common difference is red. And we started out and we said, well, we said the difference between we had red plus red and white plus white. That's how we got our common difference of red. So the difference between red oh, plus red I switch back to my and the difference between red plus red and white plus white is red, but so is the difference when we shifted it down. Red plus white. The difference between red plus white. All right, sorry, red plus green. And the difference between red plus green and red plus white is also red. And then we're going to, so the, here's, here's, we're just going to go here and we're just going to, this is just tells you the thing that we're seeing. This gives us the language that we have to talk about it, but there's not a right. We're just making observations and seeing what happens. So you have some kind of rule and this Shouldn't have surprised me, but it did. I've never done it, shifted the staircase. Only did it because you were like trying, having a hard time figuring out like how to do it. And then it comes up with this new thing. And of course, of course, that's how it would work. Anyway, any other questions? Do you have, like, did I answer your question or are you still struggling? Yes, no, no, you answered it. Thank you. That was a big help. Um, yeah, I think we're making more out of it than you needed to. Like you were getting like, there's this one thing I'm supposed to figure out and and worried about all the pieces and just play, just play. Yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right. Uh, <laughs> just ask, uh, what happens, you know, right? And right? then you're, you know, your kids, and then once you do this, you're going to say, what happens if, and then they're going to be like, what happens if the Lego guy comes in and he just flings them all over the place? Right. And then you would just say, well, they fall all over the floor. Right. But that's, that's like, and that's okay. You're done. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll just keep playing. Around. And then, and then we could look, work for the common difference of white green. Right. And just keep yes. playing around. Yeah. Keep playing. How are you going to figure it out? And the thing that you're going to notice, right. That you should eventually notice is that here, let's tidy these up. If we build a staircase, this isn't important now. But it will become important later, right? One, I'm not going to build all of them. I won't torture everybody who doesn't have a question about this. All right. So if one staircase has a difference of one and or red, white, and two staircases have a difference of red, we stack two staircases on top of each other. What will happen when we stack three staircases on top of each other? Yeah, they keep uh, the common difference keeps uh, increasing. By how much? By by one white. By one white. Yes. Isn't that cool? And then we're going to ask ourselves a question. What does this, mom, you should be thinking this in the back of your head. Where have I seen this before? Let's go ahead and let's write. Let's write. Let's just write what you see in each step, step. Tell me how much of what kind, how many of what kind. 
So three whites. Three of the whites. Three light greens. I apologize. Three of the light, light greens. Three purples. Oh, we got three red in here. Three of the red and three of the purples. And you'll notice one staircase is the table of ones, right? It's your one multiplication facts. Two staircases give you your what? Your two facts. So the difference between it's, it's if you were using these in numbers, this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And if you stack two staircases, it's two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 to 20. Three is three, six, nine, 12. Four is four, eight, 12, 16, 20. Do you see what's going, do you see what's happening? You're just getting your multiplication facts, each one. Thanks for bringing the connection to, um, you know, it's so like multiplication. And when you're writing it out, it really helps me see connected to what I learned ages ago. And that's not, it wasn't part of the lesson. It's just, that's where we went. Cause you were, you know, anyway, anyone else have comments or anything they want to questions talk about? You mentioned that when you switch to adding numbers that children tend to default back to calculation. But I remember seeing the Madeline guitar. You, you remember seeing what? I missed. Hard uh, number compositions that the children were doing, the numbers after using the blocks just for a few months. It seems like they switched from number or algebra to numbers fairly quickly in that. Well, I think that was, um, so guitar will, that, that's, we delay the, um, so they would delay the introduction of numbers and then how numbers are taught are basically the same way that they, we do the letters or the low, same way that we do. So there's a, there's an emphasis on algebra, even when you move to, that's why you can't just do start in book two. It doesn't work. Everybody has to start in book one because you lay the fact, it doesn't make sense the way he teaches math in book two, if you don't do book one. So I think if you read Gitanyo stuff, it's not that um, all of that disappears once we, uh, but if you start there or once the introduction happens, that, that, that that's the, default and unless they've been I think unless you're in the hands of a really good teacher I think that you could do both I think if you so I had this conversation in the Facebook group in the hands of a good teacher I think you can do them at the same time I don't think most teachers most parents can get away with it does that make sense should you compare yeah, yeah I think it's hard and I don't think I could have done it till maybe maybe this year, maybe last year, I think I could, I, and I still wouldn't start out with just straight up numbers. I, I would still do letters. And then I, I, I don't think I would have to do. So as I, we did, we did the algebra for three years before I introduced, I don't need to do that again. I think I could do six months of letters and then introduce numbers much sooner than I did when I first started. But I just, I teach completely differently than I did when I first started. So at some, yeah, at some point you have to introduce arithmetic. And then we're what we're doing is applying what we did with the arithmetic to, or with the algebra to the numbers. So at some point they have, it has to be, you, you gotta introduce numbers at some point, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted. No, go ahead. She answered my question. Uh, I, I do have, I'm sorry if, I, if I'm interrupting. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, one other question is, so, you know, we're doing the um, the first course, Introduction to Cruz and Her Rods. Um, and is that supposed to take us up, up like, like up to like first grade? 
So I don't even, yeah, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I guess, I guess, you know, I guess, I, I guess uh, what around what age? My son is five and a half. It was six in January. What age do you think we should finish this course on? Like, like, do you think, I, I guess, I guess my, I guess my question is, you know, as, as he's um, learning math, uh, what's, I guess, the sequence, the chronological order of math in Gatango? Like, I, I, I realize we're doing it a little bit backwards that algebra comes first. But is the rest of it kind of go hand in hand with the way? Yeah. Uh, so the, the way math is taught. So you wouldn't get brackets, fractions, factors, mm -hmm. any of the things that you're going to get by the end of course two, which, you know, I, I could teach it now in probably 18 months, right? That first book in eight, the whole book in 18 months, you wouldn't see that stuff. So assuming you're starting with a kindergartner, maybe middle of first grade, you're never going to see any of that stuff by the end of first grade, right? But you might be working with numbers inside of 20 into second grade, because that's where we're working, right? And by the time kids get in second grade, they're generally working on much larger numbers. There's not a way to put this. This is a completely different way of thinking about how we do math. So I'm not, you're not going to be able to get a scope and sequence from say Saxon and then put them side by side and then do a checkoff. It's not how it's, it's not going to work that way. So it may seem like, right, it's this forever thing that you're doing letters forever. And when are we going to get to, you know, when are we going to get to subtracting large numbers? Because I don't know, that's what the neighbor kids are doing in school, right? <laughs> right. And, and they may be delayed in getting there. Right. But but all of this other stuff is done and it's not going to take very long. So I I don't know. I can tell you that if you do it and you do it well, they'll be done with um, and you start in kin if you start when your kids are five, you should be done with all of the stuff, all of the books by the time they're in fourth grade. So you'll be done with all of elementary math by the time they hit fourth grade. The end of fourth grade. So um, and that's going slow and lazy. <laughs> okay. So, you know, as I said, like we've been dinking around with, geog with geometry and algebra for two years. And um, like we haven't finished an algebra course. We're just dinking around with it and playing and doing other stuff. <laughs> playing prime climb. We, we spent a lot of time playing prime climb. <laughs> That's great. That's great. No, uh, okay. Well, um, and then I, I know you do this uh, also as a living, like with, with other kids. And would you say even, cause I'm just also thinking about like real life application. Uh, like let's say they want to, you know, they have to take their, uh, ACTs or, um, when they're like 18, 20, they'll, uh, they won't be hindered in any way, right? In regards to that, um, like, taking yeah. So I, all I can tell you is that my 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 youngest, who has clear learning issues, and I I like to use him not because I want anyone to feel sad for him or anything or whatever. It's just like like I, I could not have done this with him had I not had like like Gatenio, which is. He, um, so we're in seventh grade, he's in seventh grade and he, we have been playing around. And then I do mean playing, like playing around with math for the last two years prior to this. So he is tested this year and his overall math score is, uh, 10 was 10th year, ninth month to 12th year, uh, eighth month, something like that, right? So like he's testing near the end of high school for math. And we haven't finished an algebra course. We've just been playing around, right? We haven't finished a geometry course. We're just playing around. And how does he, how was he able to score so high? Well, because he can reason his way because we've developed cognitive skills. and He's able to reason his way through the material that he sees, right? I, you know, I don't think that you're going to have when your kids get to see, and I've shown this before in the Facebook group, 
Like when you get to algebra, when your kids get to algebra, that's the stuff that they're testing, right? When you get on, the, like, can they do this stuff, right? When they see 3x plus 5 equals y, and you realize that your kids have been doing this, this, can you do this when you're like in high school? And you can say, well, your kids have been basically been doing this since kindergarten. They've been playing around with manipulating these symbols since because it's 3R plus 5. What are we going to make it equal to? 3R plus 5 or yellow. We can give it a yellow if we want, but we'll just leave it as 5. 3R plus 5, 3 red plus yellow. Let's make R. Oh, we got 6. That's equals. Let's do it with 4. That'll make it easier. 3R plus 4 equals orange. All right, they've been manipulating this right here, which is, if we turn that to a four, which is the same as this. This shows up on the SAT test. And we, right, we want to make sure that they get out of high school knowing this. I want to make sure your kids get out of kindergarten knowing this, right? We literally are just taking from high school and moving it to kindergarten. <laughs> Uh, I have a question. Thanks. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Sorry. 